Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the channel. This is Kwa. Um, so it's been so long since I do this again. Um, I'm really happy to be here today and uh, making this video again after a very long time. It's been like eight, nine months since I uh, start doing these tutor videos again. I received some message from the fifth semester nursing cohort uh, asking me if I'm able to provide you guys with part two or some of the more information regarding exit HESI, NCLEX, um, exam taking strategy in general. Um, it has been a very busy year for me. I just started my nursing career and um, there was a lot of things going on and my plan for the future as well. Uh, so that's why I haven't been um, doing as good as a job on tutoring or providing um, information regarding NCLEX and HESI. But um, I have some free time today. So I put up together a PowerPoint that I feel uh, will be very helpful for who that will take their exit HESI and also their NCLEX exam. Um, I talked to one of uh, your nursing uh, friend uh, in the uh, fifth semester cohort. I don't know which cohort it is right now, but um, but um, I think it's Lynette and Gabriel. Um, so they were telling me that you guys just finished your CAT, congratulations. And um, today video is going to be supportive uh, and um, help you guys in learning more about Exit HESI. Obviously, um, it has been a, a long time for me. I don't have that fresh memory anymore, but um, after all of the exam I took in nursing school, I do note down what I remember, what question I got wrong and the topic generalized in that exam uh, in my personal note. So uh, from that note, I develop a, a second PowerPoint today. Obviously, please watch my previous video, the management of care, which is very important, and also part one of the exit has the, the um, uh, must know content uh, part one. So please watch do, those two video uh, and today video as well. And thank you for being here. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, oh, before before we get started, you know, I have to talk a little bit about my credibility like people on YouTube always do. Uh, so I've been a nurse for nine months now. Uh, I had my BSN. I gra graduated from Texas and m Corpus Christi last year in May. And I started working at St. Luke's right away, uh, which is uh, in the Texas Medical Center here in Houston as an ICU nurse. I work in the medical and surgical ICU unit. Uh, it's been a crazy uh, nine months. I also recently get my uh, critical care registered nurse certifications. So I'm CCRN certified. <laughs> um, very happy about that. It will definitely not only boost my confidence in, in working in the ICU currently, but also will uh, support me if I plan to apply for graduate school uh, in, the, in the upcoming near future. All right, with that being said, I do believe that I have the knowledge and um, the capability to share this information to you guys. And hopefully if it can help you guys just a little bit, I would very be very happy. Yeah, uh, okay, let's go ahead and share my screen and go ahead, get straight into it, all right? Play from current slide, perfect. So this is exit HESI, NCLEX, CAD, Hallmark content, content. So obviously I, uh, I, like I mentioned before, I don't have the first memory of it anymore. Uh, and um, the first, the part one, the first video, I talked very comprehensively about some of the important part that I found very uh, important to know in exit HESI. This second part two is the Hallmark content content. What Hallmark content means is if you know, if you don't know this, you won't be able to answer it on the test. And these are most commonly and potentially will be on the test. So that's why I put it in this PowerPoint. 
um, I have, uh, I came across these questions. I note this question down that I came across this question in my exit SC and um, also in my, possibly in my NCLEX as well. So I think it will be very important for you guys to know this because these are hallmark content. So if you don't know this content, you won't be able to answer this type of questions in the exam. Obviously, up until this point, uh, I assume that you guys are already very strong in your message, in your management of care fundamentals, you know, kind of like cardiovascular system, um, GI, neuro, all that kind of stuff. These are some of the hallmark. These are some of the, the significant thing that always often and potentially will be asked on the NCLEX and, and the exit has seat. All right, um, these content, I got it from the note that I took the test when I was uh, in my last semester of nursing school. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and move on. So obviously today we are going to cover uh, the triage emergency versus disaster. I'm not going to read everything. It's going to take too much time, but all, but basically we are all going to go over all of these. These are some of the hallmark that, that always and often um, on the exam, we focus on so much on management of care, on prioritization, we forget about these parts. Some of these are very easy point to get on the exit HESI and the NCLEX, but sometimes we just got mixed up with other content or we forget to study this. Um, and knowing at least familiar yourself with what it is and like the NCLEX thing to know about it, we very supportive for you guys. All right, so next, let's move on, uh, jump in right away. So you have to know your triage. These are kind of like prioritization questions, um, who to see first or who to admit first, kind of like that. So emergency department triage is different with disaster triage. Emergency department is, they, this is triage, this is who, which patient you take care of first in the emergency department inside the hospital. Whereas disaster triage is this is outside the hospital in the bigger environment settings where you don't have as much resources of people. And the, the numbers are way, way larger. Okay, so emergency department triage, the priority is trauma, chest pain, respiratory distress, acute neuro. So if you have a questions asking about emergency department and triage, uh, these remember these uh these four trauma any patient that have injury from trauma any patient that have chest pain respiratory distress or acute neural symptoms like changes decreased level of consciousness that lead to uh, unable to maintain the airway pick them first they are going to be your priority so for example a question that um that will be similarly asked on the exit HESI or NCLEX would be emergency department triage is an important nursing function. A nurse working in the evening shift is presented with four patients at the same time. Which of the following patients should be assigned the highest priority? All right, so A, a patient with low grade fever, headache, uh, myalgias for the past 72 hours, a patient who is unable to bear weight on the left foot, with swelling and bruises following a running accident, a patient with abdominal and chest pain following large spicy, spicy meal, or D, a child with a one inch bleeding laceration on the chin, but otherwise well after falling while jumping on this bed. So let's go through uh, each of the answer and, and see if I'm correct or not. Obviously we know that the answer is C because I wrote it right down there. So A, low grade fever, headache, myalgia for the past 72 hours. Okay, so this patient has been having these symptom or for 72 hours. It's not acute anymore. So mm, we think about it. B, a patient who is unable to bear weight on left foot with swelling and bruising following a running accident. Okay, this can be concerning as well because it's starting to swell. They're unable to bear weight. Um, they are uh, following a running accident. This could be a compartment syndrome, um, could be emergency, but let's read more. A patient with abdominal and chest pain, ding, ding, ding. This is the key word. So anytime you see trauma, uh, chest pain, respiratory distress, or acute neural function, picked it. So that's why C is the correct answer. Um, why didn't we choose 
between B and C, the reason why is B, the patient is only currently having pain. There's no sign of bleeding. There's no issues with hemodynamically issues where a chest pain, they could have a uh, issue with the heart, uh, an MI, for example. So that's why we pick C over B. And last one, um, the child is well, otherwise well. So he's well, so, you know. Anyway, next move on to disaster triage. So for disaster triage, uh, the question you the answer you guys have to know uh, to put it uh, to put the to triage a patient as red, yellow, green, or black. So red is obviously critical. Uh, these patients need immediate attention, otherwise will die. So usually the question will ask you guys which one are red or which one are yellow. Usually they ask for red. Uh, so know this very um, by heart. So again, uh, trauma victims, client with chest pain, severe respiratory distress or cardiac arrest, limb amputation or acute neurological deficit, for example, significantly decrease in level of consciousness. The reason why level of consciousness is so important is because whenever someone have a significant decrease in level of consciousness, they won't be able to maintain the airway and they may require immediate uh, intubation for life saving, otherwise, um, the work of breathing will be increased and um, they can die from uh, unable to have, unable to ventilate and um, oxygenize their body. Yellow is second priority. These patients delay but urgent. These are non-life-threatening injury. Uh, these are non-ambulatory, meaning these patients unable to walk, uh, but they usually have open fracture wound. However, they still have a pulse and a large wounds. Green, these patients are minor and able to walk, walk ambulatory. So different between yellow and green is uh, one is able to walk and the other is unable to walk. Green is able to walk. Uh, these patients able to speak and walk. Anything that mentioned the patient able to scream, the patient able to, to voice their, that they are in severe pain and able to walk, these are yellow. Black, obviously, these are deceased patients. Uh, the question will mention that these patients no so sign of ventilation, uh, even though uh, 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 airway, their airway was open from uh, emergency intubation or, or things like that. They, those are deceased patients, so they will be black, okay? All right, next, let's move on. Pneumothorax, so this is another, um, the key thing that they always going to ask you guys because this is uh, common, easy, and often happen in the ICU or hospital in general. So pneumothorax is basically, as specifically Chanson pneumothorax is what the NCLEX always want to ask you guys and exit HESI, I saw on there, I wrote it down. Uh, pneumothorax basically is air in a plural space and unable to escape. Obviously we have the lungs, but the lung is housed within a pleural cavity and between the pleural cavity and the lungs, there is space between it. There should not be any air in it. Uh, however, because of the a puncture in the lung, the air is leaking into the pleural cavity and unable to escape and cause a, a tension pneumothorax. So just imagine there's the house and there's the, the lungs, and if the air is keeping, get adding into pleural cavity, the space, it will compress the lungs and the lung won't be able to inflate anymore. And whenever the lung unable to inflate, there won't be any oxygenation and the patient won't be able to breathe. And they, they won't be able to have oxygen go inside their body. The air is in, in the, in the uh, pleural cavity is so significant that it compresses and squish the lungs down. Uh, common cause for this is thoracentesis and central light placement. Reason is because thoracentesis, thoracentesis is a procedure where they remove the fluid from the lungs, right? And they could puncture the lung when they put the needle in. Uh, and central light placement is a, it's like an intravenous line. However, instead of going to the, uh, the vein in the peripheral area, it's going to the vein in the central area where it's like subclavian vein or um, internal jugular vein, uh, okay? And it very close to the lung, so it can puncture the lung, so that's basically it. Okay, what you need to know for the NCLEX, for pneumothorax, diminish absent lung sound on the affected side, remember. Diminish absent lung sound on the affected side, remember, okay? 
trachea deviation to the good side. So for example, the question say, the patient have an absent lung cell on the effect on the left side um, and the trachea deviate to the right side, which is the good side because the left side is absent lung cell. Um, and they have changes in level of consciousness and decreased oxygen, increased heart rate, dyspnea, meaning um, difficulty breathing. Um, what is it? It's going to be tension pneumothorax. And the treatment for us is chest tube. All right. So know this thing. Know that there will be absent lung sound on the affected side. Know that there is a trach the trachea will be deviated to the good side, uh, opposite to the to the area where there's no lung sound. And then there will be decreasing level of consciousness. The reason why there's a decreasing level of consciousness is because there's no oxygen going up to the brain and the brain won't be able to function. Uh, decrease oxygen, obviously, increase heart rate because the body is in anxiety mode, they are screaming for air, and uh, dyspnea is difficulty breathing because they only have one lung left. Uh, treatment is chest tube, chest tube in order to um, get all of that air out and, um, and uh, resume the negative pressure in the lungs. Next, interceptions. All right, so I I honestly forget about this, but when I look at back in my note, I saw that I wrote interception down. That means that there probably was a question about interceptions. We don't even remember this because we took this in OB, which is like third semester. To me, it's like years ago. I don't even remember it. So I look at my back in my note. Um, so basically interceptions, uh, it's like, it's like a, it's like a, we call it a zebra because like it's so rare. Uh, however, the end like sometimes they ask that and in the exit, exit HESI, they randomly throw in these questions. So interception is basically part of the intestine that slide into an adjacent part of the intestine. So usually, so what that means is, is this an intestine and this is an intest the intestine is slide into the that intestine. All right, so basically it's called telescoping. It happened in baby less than two years old. Uh, you don't need to know this. Um, so NCLEX things to know, whenever you see the word interception, just basically think that the intestine is like locked, it's like just within each other and happen in pediatric. Uh, it uh, caused infarction in the bowel. What does infarction mean? Infarction mean there's meaning that there's like an obstruction in the perfusion of blood. Uh, so uh, there's no blood flow to the blood vessel because they are trapped due to the telescoping, uh, which can lead to perforation. The reason why it can lead to perforation, meaning um, open um, of the intest opening of the intestine is because um, there's no blood flow, it, the tissue get dead and then it deteriorate and then there'll be opening. Uh, and cause sepsis, sepsis meaning infection. The reason why cause sepsis and death is because if there's a perforation and it's an intestine, so what is inside intestine? There's acidic bowel content, fecal matters, everything will go outside from the hole that were perforated on the, that intestine. So that's why it causes infection, acidotic, and death, all right? But the key thing I want you guys to remember about interception is the baby will have current jelly and olive shaped stool. That's all you need to know. Next, Hirschsprung disease. So Hirschsprung disease, um, I put it right next to interception because um, they are two kind, they are two big kind of stool of in the baby that you guys need to know because it's very important. They usually don't ask a lot of questions about pediatric on the NCLEX or the exit HESI, but they only ask like big things, like rare big things that they, they ask about. And these are usually one of them. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Hirschsprung disease is a baby condition in which the baby intestinal nerve cells don't develop properly and lead to delay in stool progressions. Yeah, self-explanatory. What I need you guys to know is ribbon-like stool. This baby who have the Hirschsprung disease will have ribbon-like stool. Compared to uh, interception, they will have all the shape and current jelly stool. These baby have ribbon-like stool. The infant unable to pass meconium in a short time after birth. Usually healthy infant, when they poop, 
they should poop within 24 hours of birth. And meconium is a sticky, dark first poop of the newborn. So no student in the first 24 to 48 hours of life, abdominal distension and abdominal pain. All right, just no ribbon like stool and no stool in the first 24 to 48 hours of life. There's a question that they saying the baby was born uh, for already 48 hours. They don't have any stool yet. Uh, they haven't passed their meconium. Immediately think about her sprung disease. Uh, if or if they say anything about the baby passed some stool and it's ribbon like, then it's her sprung disease. All right. Next. Repeated gravid. So I remember I have this question because I noted down on my HESI, exit HESI. Um, it was asking something about this woman having repeated gravid. What is she at risk for? So basically, uh, repeated gravid. Gravid is having a pregnancy or having a yeah, having a pregnancy, having a baby inside stomach. Um, repeated mean multiple, repeated. <laughs> And the next thing I need you guys to know is this can lead to uterine atony, which can cause excessive hemorrhage, bleeding following childbirth. All right. So next, DKA. DKA always, they're going to always ask you guys this because this is such a common um, pathophysiology that's always come, um, not only in the test, but also in real life. Um, DKA usually only happen in type 1 diabetes. Um, it's, and it's also good to know DK as well, you guys. It's so common. If you guys work in the ICU, it's so, so common. Basically, uh, no insulin to allow sugar into cells lead to significant high blood sugar and the metabolism of fat for energy, which then lead to byproduct of ketone, hence the name. And ketone is acidic, so it makes the blood more acidic, which is lethal to the body. All right. Oh, this whole time I forget to make my face bigger. All right. Anyway, I'm making it bigger now. <laughs> so you guys can see me better. Um, anyway, where are we? So type 1 diabetes, DKA. So it's very self, self-explanatory from the description that I wrote. Basically, in DKA, uh, these are type 1 diabetic patient. Um, they don't have insulin. And whenever you don't have insulin, they're unable to um, allow the sugar into, to be utilized by the cells. Therefore, um, the cell is starving for sugar to create energy. And the blood is significantly high sugar. So... Um, because the cells need to generate energy and need energy to work, so it will use fat. And whenever it's used fat, which it metabolizes the fat cells in the body, it will lead to a byproduct, which is ketone. All right. And whenever there's ketones, it is acidic, so it causes the blood to become acidic. And whenever the blood is acidic, it's not healthy for the blood vessel, it's not healthy for the body, the body will scream and they can go into shock and metabolic acidosis. And the next thing that I need you guys to know about DKA, obviously the treatment, which we will cover in the next slide, uh, but also the sign symptom of this. Sign symptom are very, very important to know hyperglycemia because obviously there is such a significant um, level of blood sugar inside the blood vessels. So there will be hyperglycemia. So usually they are hot and dry, uh, dehydration, tachycardia, hypotension, uh, polyuria, and thirsty. These patients pee a lot and they very thirsty because of the uh, dryness, dehydration inside the body. Uh, they are very lethargic, nausea, vomiting, uh, and as the disease progress, the, they will have cushmo respiration, deep but rapid breathing uh, because the body trying to expel the carbon dioxide uh, to compensate for the acidosis, all right? So uh, remember what is cushmo breathing? Cushmo breathing is not sweet and fruity breath odor. Those are different. Cosmo breathing is a type of pattern uh, of breathing. So Cosmo breathing is deep, but rapid. 
breathing because the body trying to expel the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also acidic. It's trying to compensate for the high level of the ketone, which cause the body, the pH to be acidic, all right? A sweet, fruity breath odor is another sign symptom that comes with DKA. Uh, typical uh, uh, arterial blood gas analysis will look like low pH acidic and low bicarbonate SO3. So these patients are always in metabolic acidosis. So know this. No sign symptom, know that they are metabolic acidosis. If they give you an ABG and they ask you which ABG are DKA patients, pick low pH, low bicarbonate, all right? And they also have positive high level ketones in the urine. All right, next we move on to the treatment. Oops, the treatment DKA continue. You have to know this, all right? The goal to prevent, the goal in treatment for DKA is to prevent uh, hypovolemic shock due to dehydration uh, caused by high level of blood sugar and polyuria. Uh, you guys need to administer fluid, fluid resuscitation, normal saline to prevent hypovolemia. These patients have so high sugar content in their blood, therefore uh, they are at significant risk for uh, dehydration. So fluid resuscitation is the first thing, not insulin, fluid. Fluid is the first priority thing in DKA, remember that? In DKA, prioritization is fluid resuscitation, fluid, fluid, fluid. Then we can start IV insulin regular. So um, regular insulin is the only insulin that can be administered through via IV. What is IV? Intravenous, through the vein. You don't give is a regular insulin uh, for DKA via subcute. Um, injection. You give insulin or um, regular IV for DKA through IV, all right? When the blood sugar reaches 250, then we change the fluid to dextro 5% added in normal saline. Basically, we give them some, um, some, 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 some water, some sugar water uh, to prevent rapid reduction of the blood sugar. All right, here's another the thing that you guys must know about DKA treatment. Please monitor your potassium level. Always remember this. Not only for NCLEX, but also your um for your for your ICU career later or for nursing career later. If the patient on an insulin drip, check the damn potassium. Otherwise, they'll code. Um must monitor for potassium, all right, you guys. The reason is because when you whenever we give um IV insulin or significant amount of insulin, um, it can bring the potassium back to the cells and causes hypokalemia that can cause um, um VTAC or VFib. All right. Multiple myeloma. Basically, these are cancer uh in bone marrow that cause overproduction of calcium in the bone. Uh, I had a question about multiple myeloma in my exit C. I think I mentioned in one, in one of those previous video a long time ago, but there's the question about it. So please just, just know what it is. Um, so yeah, so basically it's cancer and um, it's caused an overproduction of calcium. And Clex thing to know because of this overproduction of calcium in the bone, uh, spill into the blood lead to significant high level of calcium hypercalcemia and this is very hard on the kidney because the kidney filter out uh, potassium and calcium and uh, significant high level of calcium overwork the kidney which will result in high BUN and creatinine. Uh, the bone will become frail and fragile because they used up all of the calcium and it spill into the blood it doesn't stay in the bone. All right, next. Oops, oops, sorry. Okay, Addison disease. All right, obviously know your Addison disease, know your Cushing disease, know your hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, myxedema, coma, uh, great disease, which is thyroid storm. But they always, for some reason, ask about Addison disease, especially the uh, electrolyte part, um, 
But yeah, so what, what is Addison disease? Addison disease is hyposecretion of cortisol and aldosterol. Hyposecretion meaning not secrete enough, hypo. Cortisol uh, is a steroid stress hormone, regulate blood sugar, and aldosterone regulates sodium and water, uh, and also potassium. Fun fact, both are released by adrenal gland on top of the kidney. So think about the kidney function. Think about the kidney function, uh, which is keep the sodium and filter out potassium and calcium, all right? NCLEX thing to know. Signs and symptoms include blood sugar, low blood sugar, low glucose, because they don't have enough cortisol secrete, the patient will be usually have a low blood sugar. Uh, and because of low blood sugar, they're gonna be lethargic, anorexic, um, low sodium, uh, because there's not enough aldosterone hormone. Aldosterone hormone uh, is a hormone secreted by the adrenal gland and its job is to um, regulate sodium. Uh, it, it releases sodium so that the body can conserve water and retain the volume. Um, so because not enough aldosterone, so they have low sodium. And um, because um, they this addition disease is a adrenal gland issue, which is a kidney issues. Uh, so um, they will have and the kid when the if, when it is a kidney issue, the kidney won't work like it's supposed to work. So they will have um low level a uh, high level of potassium because the job of the kidney is supposed to be filtering out potassium, but it doesn't work. So you guys have we have high potassium. Uh, so it can lead to VTAC or VFib, which is the ho the hallmark side of hyperkalemia is peak T wave. All right, so remember that. A decent crisis, this is when the body is going to shock because of absent steroid and the kidney is malfunction. Sign symptom, low blood pressure, most critical. Can kill the patient due to hypovolemic shocks. Uh, low weight from water loss and cold intolerance. Immunocompromise, which increased risk of infections. These patients always have tan, gold, or brown skins. Treatment is give steroid, anything that end in S-O-N-E, SON, uh, or monitor intake and output, or cut the adrenal uh, gland, adrenolectomy, and check the blood sugar to prevent uh, too low of the blood sugar. So that's it. So what to know? No sign symptom. No, definitely know that low sodium, high potassium, tan brown skin gives steroid, which is an zone, and they can have a um a risk for hypoglycemia. Symptom of hypoglycemia. What is it? One, two, three. Cold and clammy. All right. Usually also very lethargic, decreasing level of consciousness as well. Next, tetralogy of phthalate. Tetralogy of phthalate is another big thing in pediatric that we learn. Um, it will be on the exam, you guys. It usually is. It's, it's so big. Um, it includes four defects, pulmonary stenosis, VSD, overriding aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy. Don't really need to remember, know about it. And quite thing to know, the baby who have the trilogy of phallus usually very cyanotic. Uh, we have to keep the kid calm during cyanotic spell. That's all you need to know. Meningitis, infection of the brain and spinal cord. So meningeal is the like a membrane aligning in the brain, and itis is an infection. So meningitis is the infection of the lining of the brain or the spinal cord. Um, and Clex, they need to know about this which will be asked, by the way, lumbar puncture, collect. What, why do we do lumbar puncture? The reason we do lumbar puncture is to collect um, cerebrospinal fluid for culture because it's an infection. We want to culture it, to know what kind of bacteria that is so that we can give antibiotic and treat it, right? So, uh, so that meningitis. Sign and symptom, please know chronic and Brzezinski side. If you don't know what those side are, just know that they are associated with meningitis. 
Kernick and Brzezinski, all right? So basically, Kernick is extension of the knee on a flex hip at a 90 degree cause restriction and pain. So what is it? So basically, a patient is lying down like this, lean flat, and uh, we, ex we extend the hip uh, to 90 degree. This is the hip to 90 degree, and then this is the leg, and we extend the leg out. We extend the leg up and they they have significant pain. So that's Kernick sign. I really doubt that they ask you what to describe the whole Kernick sign, uh, but just know that Kernick and Brzezinski size are associated with meningitis. Uh, Brzezinski sky sign is severe neck stiffness caused by a patient hip uh, and needs to flex when the neck is flexed. All right. So when the patient went, when like, so like the patient lay flat like that and they have like the knees up and then they, they, they extend the neck and then they feel stiffness and pain. But yeah, high white blood count and changes level of consciousness because it's the brain, so it's affect the level of consciousness and because it's an infection, so it causes high blood count. And because it's high blood count infection, it causes fever because it's a inflammatory response. And no nuchal rigidity, stiff necks. You have to know the nuchal rigidity, know this. If they say anything about nuchal rigidity, they say anything about Koenig's sign or Brzezinski sign, immediately think meningitis, immediately think lumbar puncture, immediately think cerebral spinal fluid culture, immediately think antibiotic. Uh, and the patient usually have horrible headache. Next. Quality of pain. These are super easy, you guys, but sometimes they give you like a bunch of nonsense answers and just very similar to each other. You don't know which one to choose. So here I am telling you just what you need to know. Quality of pain, what you need to know for NCLEX or exit HESI, how it is how is it measured? It is measured by how the patient feel not your own interpretation, how the patient feel, how do they um, describe the pain, aching, dull, sharp, it will ask you that. Tetany, hypocalcemia. So obviously, please know all of you electrolyte, know hyper, hypokalemia, hyper, hypocalcemia, magnesia, and phos, all that kind of thing. But, um, I always see they ask about hypocalcemia, like always. They're going to ask about uh, kalemia to potassium is another important thing. But uh, all right, but now we talk about hypocalcemia. So hypocalcemia, usually uh, the biggest sign is tetany, uh, which basically means muscular spasm. Um, the calcium range is 911. So I remember it's like 911, you know, 911 emergency. Um, and Clex thing to know, soft stick sign and trozo signs. So please know those two signs. Know the Kernick sign and Brzezinski sign for the meningitis, but also know job stick sign and trozo sign by your heart for hypocalcemia. Uh, job stick sign is twitch of the facial muscle that occur when tap the cheek. When we tap the patient's cheek, uh, it causes um, twitching of the face. And then trousal side, uh, which is flexion of the wrist and, and thumb whenever there's a blood pressure cuff is inflated. Um, anytime they talk about a parathyroidectomy, parathyroidectomy, parathyroid, yeah, parathyroidectomy or a parathyroid gland removal, it will cause hypoglycemia, you guys, or even the thyroid gland because this is a thyroid gland, like the butterfly thyroid gland, right? So the parathyroid gland are on it. So if they remove the thyroid gland or the parathyroid gland, it will lead to hypocalcemia because these glands regulate calcium. It releases calcium. And if they cut this, the patient at risk for hypocalcemia, and how do we know? In nursing, HESI, exit HESI and NCLEX, they always ask about sign and symptom. Always sign and symptom. So no job stick sign, trozo sign, all right? Um, and also hypocalcemia can cause cardiac arrhythmia, uh, which can cause prolonged QT interval, AKA prolonged QT prolongation. I don't think that they're going to ask you guys like what is QT prolongation. Just kind of know that it's uh, hypocalcemia associated with QT prolongation. Um, just 
just for your fun fact to know what is QT Pro. So QT is the like, you know, like QRS, T wave, uh, P wave, all that kind of stuff. So QT interval is when the start of the QRS and to the end of the T wave. So basically it's like the whole duration when um, the herd is um, depolarized and repolarized, uh, the longer the QT prolongation is, the longer the herd take it time to charge itself and to start initiate a beat again. And if it's too long, it can lead to lethal arrhythmia such as VFib or VTAC or sudden cardiac arrest. So basically that is QT prolongation, but you don't have to know that until you in you work. Uh, for NCLEX, just know it's associated with QT prolongation if you have hypocalcemia. Next, hepatic encephalopathy. So what is this? Hepatic, liver, encephalopathy, brain issues. Basically occur in liver failure or cirrhosis patients. These patients uh, often have their ammonia level too high uh, that lead to a loss in the brain function. Uh, NCLEX things to know. They will have flapping tremor. Their hands will be flapping like this. And they will have asteresic. Asteresic, uh, they can use the word interchangeably, uh, either flapping tremor or asteresic. Uh, treatment for hepatic encephalopathy is lactulose. This medication decreases intestinal absorption and production of ammonia and causes the patient to have bowel movement to get rid of ammonia. You know, if you work in a medical ICU unit, you hate lactulose because whenever you give to the patient, the patient poop like crazy, but it helps the patient. It's, it's insane how, how you can see the instant gratification of the medication when you give to the patient and how it works so fast. And it gives the patient, it changes the patient's signs symptom. So it's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, um, these patients usually have low level of consciousness or very, they are very agitated uh, because the level of ammonia is so high because the liver unable to, 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 um, what is the word in English, to, 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 to clean it uh, or to expel it. Uh, so they have high level ammonia and they have flapping tremor, also known as asterisks, and we treat them with lactulose. It's like a laxative. It pull the, the, the ammonia into the poop and then make the patient poop. GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome. All right, I remember I have a question about this on my NCLEX. I talk about it in my NCLEX video, I think. So basically GBS, I, I remember it as a growl to brain syndrome. Professor Nasa taught me this. Um, I miss her so much. Uh, so basically this is an inflammatory neuro disease that caused by a viral infection. Um, and click thing to know is reversible. It is a loss of motor function starting from ground to brain. Ascending paralysis. So the paralysis caused by a viral infection, it starts slowly from the feet up to the brain. Uh, eventually, it affects the respiratory system because it, if it causes paralysis in the diaphragm, it can cause the diaphragm not to move up and down anymore. And how do we breathe? We breathe when the diaphragm move up and down. So eventually it affects the respiratory system, cause issue with breathing and may require mechanical ventilations. I remember, listen carefully, listen. I remember that in my NCLEX, the question asked me this exact. Um, what is out of these four arterial blood gas analysis, um, which one will show in a GBS, GBS patient? All right. Anytime that you have a GPS patients and you have uh, uh, arterial blood gas analysis, they will always have respiratory acidosis. GPS patient will have respiratory acidosis. Why? The reason is because if they have a paralysis in the diaphragm, there will be a decrease in ventilation. And what is the biggest uh, indication for ventil ventilation? CO2, right? 
So they will have significant high level of CO2 because the body is not breathing, it's not expelling CO2 out, carbon dioxide out. So it's retaining CO2. So their blood gas will have high level of CO2 and low level of pH because CO2 is acidic and it causes the pH to be low, to be acidic. So these patients will have respiratory acidosis, low level of pH, low level of um, PaO2, and possibly low level of PaO2, and normal to high level of uh, bicarbonate. Treatment is immunoglobulins, IV, IG. Uh, it's basically good protein uh, that help come in the body, help fight the viral infections, because obviously it's a viral infection. We can't treat it with antibiotic. We have to treat it with um, protein, um, immunoglobulins. Or plasmapheresis, this is a procedure where it basically it, it's like dialysis, but um, it's, it's replacing the patient plasma with new plasma. Oops. Okay, next. Myasthenia, myasthenia gravis. Notice, you guys, this not, is not enough secretion of acetylcholine. Uh, what is acetylcholine? I didn't even remember it either, but it's uh, it is basically a neurotransmitter. Um, we, the, the brain and the muscle in our body function through neurotransmitter. Uh, that's how they communicate. So if my hands are moving, my brain is sending neurotransmitter to my muscle so that I can move. Um, and in patient with myasthenia gravis, the neurotransmitter are, are not secrete or produced enough. So there's a breakdown in the communication between the brain and nerve and the muscle. What do you guys need to know? Um, what, which neurotransmitter is affected, which is acetylcholine? Myasthenia gravis, acetylcholine. This disease causes muscle weakness of the diaphragm. Again, this is another muscular disease that because of uh, an autoimmune disease uh, due to a uh, hyposecretion of acetylcholine. So the diaphragm uh, is affected. It can cause weakness in the diaphragm. And like I mentioned, if there's a weakness in the diaphragm, there will be a decrease in ventilation and they will have respiratory acidosis. And uh, in this case, they also may have respiratory paralysis and may need mechanical ventilation. Note the treatment. The treatment is pyridostigmine py and neostigmine. Just remember the stigmine. Yeah. All right, next. Ventricular tachycardia. All right, sorry if I'm moving too fast, um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but if you, can, you guys can pause it, right? You guys can pause and just take a break, I guess. Uh, ventricular tachycardia, basically this is a lethal heart rhythm when the ventricle beats too quickly. Obviously know your A flutter, A fib, those, video, those uh, vital signs as well, but um, these are like the bigger thing that I just want to touch over for you guys because it's usually ask. Um, yeah, VTAC, basically lethal heart rhythm uh, when the ventricle beats too quickly. So NCLEX thing you guys need to know for VTAC, how to identify the rhythm on the strip. They will give you the strip and you have to know, all right, is this VTAC, VFib, or what is it? So this is VTAC, it looked like tombstone, yeah, similar. How to, uh, first thing to do in VTAC is we have to assess the patient for the pose, either carotid pose or femoral pose. So check for the pose. If the patient have a pose, meaning, you know, you feel a pose. If the patient have a pose, this is a stable VTAC. So what do we do in a stable VTAC? We would try to do a give them a mutarone bolus, or we do synchronized cardioversion. We don't shock them. We we don't defibrillate them. We synchronize cardiovert them. Do not confuse with defibrillation, aka shock, aka unsynchronized. The reason why I I I'm I wrote that down is because we often confuse. So synchronized cardioversion versus defibrillation, those are two different things. Synchronized cardioversion is we still give them electrical stimuli, 
to snap them out of that lethal rhythm. However, we synchronize with the QRS. The 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 defibrillator it the the defibrillator is synchronized with the QRS is synchronized, so it will give the patient a shock when the Q when it's synchronized with the QRS, um to snap them out that to snap them out of that um that lethal rhythm. Next, if the patient have this sim this uh strip on the monitor and there's no pulse, this is unstable VTAC. Unstable VTAC meaning no pulse, meaning this strip and no pulse, unstable. What do we do? Anything, anytime, anywhere you see the word no pulse, no matter the rhythm, start CPR. You start CPR first, uh, walk, and then you shock the patient, okay? Defibrillate the patient. Defibrillate the patient, shock the patient. This is unsynchronized, meaning that it the, the machine doesn't have to synchronize with the QRS complex. It should give the shock what, like automatically without synchronized with the QRS. That means defibrillation. And that only used for unstable VTAC, aka pulseless VTAC. And then um, you know, we give epinephrine uh, every three minutes to resuscitate them. Um, ACLS protocol. Um, but main thing to know, CPR and shock for pulseless VTAC. Next, VFib. So VTAC and VFib are two really lethal uh, rhythm. Uh, basically, VFib is lethal heart rhythm where the ventricle is beating too rapidly and in an uncoordinated manner. Um, you see the difference? It's very uncoordinated. It's, it's not like VTAC where it's like tombstone and uh, very wide QRS complex. And these are YQRS complex as well, but it's look very um, uncoordinated. And next thing to know, know how to identify the strip. Obviously, look at the strip, you know, it's whether VTAC or VFib. Assess for the pose, again, any changes in the, um, in the rhythm, uh, assess for pose. Then, um, if you see this rhythm, you assess for the pose, there's no pose. CPR immediately, if no pose, Y charging, the defibrillator, defibrillate and shock the patient when ready and then give them epinephrine. So kind of same treatment with pulseless VTAC. However, just know the difference between uh, the rhythm, all right? Uh, because we talk about like dysrhythmia, heart EKG, which I just want to mention this. So uh, if they give you a question that the patient uh, on the monitor, so a systole, um, you come in and you assess the patient first. Sometimes the patient leads are just off. They just come in and, and before you like freaking out or call the code. Every time you must assess the patient first, all right? Next, Kawasaki disease. Like, I'm like, what the hell is this? But it's, it's, it's will be asked you guys. It's like something that we don't, we don't, we forget about it. But like, if we know it, we know it. Uh, basically, this is an inflammation in the wall of some blood vessel in the body. Unknown cause happen in children less than five years old. You don't need to remember that. What you need to remember about Kawasaki disease, strawberry tongue, strawberry tongue. So I remember this. It's like Kawasaki. It sounds very Japanese. And, um, you know, I should think that about strawberry from Japan. Yeah, so strawberry tongue, Kawasaki. Yeah. Next, we have preeclampsia and eclampsia. So this, you guys, this will be on the exam. Um, if it's not on XSS, it will be on the NCLEX. We will ask this because this is very big in pregnancy, very big in OB. So basically, it is high blood pressure in pregnant women. Uh, it can cause seizures. That's the biggest issues. And also, it can cause health syndrome in the mom, in the pregnant woman. It can cause hemolysis, meaning like the lysis, the breakdown of red blood cells, elevated liver enzyme, uh, low platelets in the mother. The reason why it causes elevated liver enzyme is because the red blood cells are lysis and the liver have to overwork to, uh, to clean up those lysed red blood cells, so it's, it causes a liver overwork and increasing liver enzyme, leads to liver failure, low platelets in the mother. This is life-threatening, all right? 
So Caesar and help syndrome, no, what is help syndrome? No, no Caesar is associated with eclampsia and preeclampsia and know that those are high blood pressures. So if you have a pregnant woman with high blood pressure and showing sign of severe edema, this is priority. High blood pressure and edema, you see these patients first. If they give you a question about who out of these four patients you see first, pick this woman, preeclampsia woman, high blood pressure, pregnant woman, uh, edematous pregnant woman. Treatment for this, bed rest and magnesium sulfate for seizure prevention. So um, I don't think they asked you guys about the doses of the magnesium sulfate. So we delivered the baby even if premature because it's safer for the baby. All right, next, proton pump inhibitor. So this is a medication that uh, came on my exotasy. This is a decrease in gastric restrict, uh, bleh. This is a, a decrease in gastric secretion and basically stomach acid. It's still a relief, GERD, and PUD. You know, in the hospital, they always give this to prevent any ulcer in the stomach from developing. Um, and also um, give for a patient with like um, esophageal varicity as well, uh, beside arteriocyte. But anyway, you guys don't need to know that. What you need to know, NCLEX thing right now, the it, proton pump inhibitor, it decreases the gastric secretion. It decreases the stomach acid. How to evaluate the effectiveness? This would, was, was asked on my uh, HESI, what they asked about this. They asked, so in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the PPI uh, medication, we asked the patient about gastrointestinal pain and discomfort. All right, so that's how we evaluate it. It's, it's effectiveness. Okay, next, know your pressure ulcer stage. Stage one, two, three, four, and unstageable. You guys have to know this, you guys. You guys have to know this. Um, stage one, the skin is intact, non blanchable redness. If they say anything about the patient has been laying on the bed for several hours, uh, when assessing the sacral area, there's still uh, the skin is still intact. However, and it's however it's non-blanchable, uh, meaning like when you push again, it is not turning, it's turning white, but it, but it's not, but it's not turning white and returning to red immediately. Um, sorry, non non-blanchable redness, meaning that the area. Is intact, but it's red. When you push your finger against it, it's supposed to turn white, but in stage one, it does not turn white. That's all. So that means non blanchable. Stage two is not intact. There's a partial loss of the dermis, which is the skin layer. Stage three is full thickness into dermis and subcutaneous tissues. Stage four, is full thickness that expose the bone, tendon, and muscle, all right? Know your stages, they will ask them. Next, we have unstageable, anything that have scar, meaning dead or black tissue, or slough, dead white blood cells, those are unstageable, okay? Next, know your drug antidotes, you guys. Um, these are like the main thing that they will ask. Um, I saw like people study so many, but like they never asked. These are like the main thing. Yeah. No antidote for vitamin uh, or water is vitamin K. No antidote for heparin, which is protamine sulfate. No antidote for benzodiazepine is flum flumazenil. And then opiate morphine is naloxone, Narcan. And then acetaminophen is N-acetylcysteine. All right know that oh my god we done let me exit from my screen and stop sharing okay so um i didn't think that we did it that fast but um but yeah you guys that's 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 all for today uh thank you so much for for watching the video um 
I will probably try to, to do a practice question, another session, another YouTube video and post it on for you guys to help you guys with the exam. But all I want to say is it's all going to be good, you guys. Just do your best. Um, take, answer the question slowly. Don't read into the question. Answer what they ask. Trust in your trust yourself. Trust the process. It's go all going to be okay. Nursing in real life is very different with nursing school, but obviously there are topic in nursing school that will help you guys to be an exceptional and an amazing nurse. Um. So, but anyway, you guys are gonna be all okay. Um, I wish you guys luck, and as 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 promised, I will try my best to to do another um, like uh practice question session, and if and I found any more uh study materials, um, I will I'll post it or 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 I put it in the description box below, okay, so you guys can download and study it, um. Just watch my previous video, okay? Watch my management of care. Watch my um, prioritization must know for HESI and NCLEX. Those are very helpful. Those are when I, I have the first memory of the exam. Um, so I wish you guys luck and thank you so much for watching my video. Okay, now last, let me do a thumbnails. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> anyway, thank you, you guys. Goodbye. Good luck.